All right, welcome everybody to the Great Plains Regeneration Farmer Friday webinar series. I, it is my pleasure today to have Dr. Trish Jackson with us with Prairie Food. She is in Kansas. Hi, Trish, how are you? Hello, I'm doing great. How are you today, Jess? Oh, it is a beautiful day. I've got my fall cardigan on. I've got my GPR t-shirt, a little bit of logo in the background. So I'm doing pretty good. Finally seeing a taste of fall here. All right, let's get started with the presentation. So you're all here to learn about Great Plains Regeneration and we're so glad that you did. But I do have an assignment for you. Number one, I want you to take out your cell phone and open up your camera app because your camera app is going to allow you to see our QR code. So if everybody doesn't mind, um, go ahead and open up your camera app, scan over the QR code, and that will take you to the Great Plains Regeneration website. That's how you can find out more information about us, learn about our programming, and stay in contact. The other thing that I would love for you to do is cameras on. I love it when we can see everybody's face. Go ahead and type any questions that you have in the chat. This is an open conversation style webinar and we just really, really want to get started. So Great Plains Regeneration, we have an amazing partner in the Kansas Alliance for Wetlands and Streams. I always mention them um, because as we liaison together with farmers and ranchers to be able to improve the overall soil health, we are also working with Kansas Alliance for Wetlands and Streams to work about downstream water quality. And their mission is really the water, the lands and the people and being able to bring us all together. So that part is super excited. So what is GPR? What do we do? The way in which we activate our mission is through farmer-led education. We work on watershed restoration and we work on regenerative marketplace development. If you have been a fan of the GPR webinars, you've probably heard about some of our um, developments that we do. We did produce a beer recently that was sold in the Northeast Kansas market. We actually sold out of it. It was called Farmer Eve and it was um, kind of a light and crisp German wheat beer. Um, so if you had the opportunity to, to taste that, Put your, put your comments in the chat if you got to taste the GPR beer and tell us what you thought about it. So just a little bit about regenerative agriculture, which is really the main reason why we're all here today. We believe that regenerative agriculture can work anywhere that there's soil. And we have identified five principles that um, you know anybody across the world can adhere to. But I always wanna stress that the practices that producers take to achieve any one principle might look differently. So even in the state of Kansas, what can go on in Northeast Kansas isn't always what can happen in Southwest Kansas um, to achieve the principles of regenerative agriculture. So GPR and our partners, we're not looking necessarily to tell a farmer how to farm. What we're trying to do is create a situation where there are tools and there are education available for people who do want to learn about these topics. So that's why you're all here today. Here's a little bit about who we are and you can find that information out on our website. We have a number of advisors and we have um, groups in Colorado, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Missouri, Texas, and we are growing. So if you wanna be a part of our team, there's a form on our website, go ahead and fill it out. Okay, the real reason why we're here, we're talking to Prairie Food. And Trish, are you still there, Trish? I'm here. Okay. Hello. And you, yeah, I'm going to change my view so I can see. There we go. Gotcha. Okay, Trish. So uh, we're going to talk about the Prairie Food Forum a little bit later because the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get to know you. We're going to get to know a little bit about your background and what, uh, you know, how you got led into this whole soil health thing. So the second assignment that everybody has right now is if you still have your cell phone out, there's a second QR code here. So grab your cell phone, open up your photo app, and it will take you to our website where you can register for our Prairie Food Forum and Soil Health Workshop that is coming up soon. So um, here are the speakers. We've got a couple of these folks on the call with us today. We are super excited. The event is going to be November 15th and 16th. Um, really, this is just, besides, besides the person on the bottom left, this is a whole bunch of rock stars, right? And we're having them all in Kansas, and it's going to be a great time. So 
with that, I'm going to stop talking everybody's ear off about Great Plains Regeneration, and we're really, really going to get into learning more about our featured speaker today. Um, if you want to screenshot that, that's how you can get a hold of me. And I will stick this information in the chat box so you can learn a little bit more about that. So Trish, what's up? How are you? I'm doing so good. As you know, Jess, I, I spent last weekend with the Soil Sisters. And so anybody here that wants to be a Soil Sister is welcome to do that. Um, but I'm kind of riding this high after being around some amazing people. Can't hear you, Jess. You muted yourself. All right. I have to use my really, really attractive headset here. How does this? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you now. Okay, good deal. Um, and I want to thank uh, Liz Haney. She's in the background. I call her my Zoom ninja. And so I always have to do like my ninja hands to represent that she's my Zoom ninja. She helps me <laughs> out with all of, she helps me out with a lot of the stuff behind the scenes for these webinars. So thank you so much. And Liz is one of our soul sisters. So um, like Trish said, any, really anybody who wants to be a part of this, this fun group that we call soul sisters, um, you're in like, that's, that's how it works. Like anybody who is passionate about the soil, who wants to learn about making a difference and, and who are already making a difference. Um, yeah. So you're in, so soul sisters, raise, raise your hand, everybody. <laughs> okay, Trish, let's talk about your background because you have an amazing journey that has brought you to the love of the soil. And you have a lot of topics that align very closely to some of my passions. So, you know, let's start with in the beginning. How did you get involved with working in this space? I've been thinking about this, Jess, because you, you told me I'd be talking about it. And what it made me remember is all of the people in my history that have helped me make course corrections. And I'm sure all of you have a similar story like this how you got to find this path that you're on uh, that makes so much sense. It's like, how did we not figure this out sooner? Um, but my, my journey really started uh, when I started studying geography. And if you're not familiar with really what geography is, it's not necessarily a study of place names, but it's the study of just space and time and relationships of all of Earth's natural systems. So that appealed to me because I could learn about water resources, the geology, the atmosphere, you know, all of these things and how they combine together and how they influence people's lives and how people can influence the Earth as well. And so that was, that was a profound um, education for me. And I also did chemistry. So I kind of got this like macro scale, holistic, um, start to understand right the earth as well as what was going on at the at the micro scale so once I figured that out I took up my first soil class and then it was all over after that so anybody that's ever <laughs> you know had any formal training in soil or just went down the rabbit hole knows right Jess you did this yeah independently. oh I mean I completely relate to course correction um anytime that it's so funny. I was talking to a person that's, that's kind of a mentor of mine today. And he talked about making decisions as you're a flowing river. And I'm so sorry, that's kind of nerdy and deep. Um, but yeah, <laughs> talking about, about course corrections, I think farmers and ranchers, because we deal with natural systems, um, your brain has to be, has to have that flexibility in it to be able to look at a situation and be like, oh yeah, that's not what I planned you know, and how do you keep making those changes? So, so geography, you know, people, places, things. Um, one of the first presentations I ever heard you give, you, you really talked about place-based agriculture and you talked about um, this coming together and relocalizing food issues. Mm -hmm. That's so exactly tell me right. a little bit. <laughs> yeah, okay, tell me yeah. a little bit about it. Well, farmers are, you know, experts um, about their place and their soil and what works there. And so like that, um, our knowledge is place-based. And so our, one of the things I learned that was another profound lesson in my life is how we have this kind of food system that has suffered from um, this concentrated, you know, these concentrated hubs. And if we have, if we want to have more resiliency in nature or in our food system, any system like that, we need to have a more distributed system. Um, and, and so in our food systems, you know, you've heard recently about like this salmonella outbreak on onions. 
those sorts of issues are caused by the, 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 the form of our food system. And so the more we rely on local systems, you know, the more connected we are to our farmers and our land, and, you know, the more fresh and, and healthy and nutrient dense that food is, because it's not sitting on a shelf for months and months. Um, so that idea of a resilient food system was the main topic of my dissertation. In fact, um, I think the title was, I know the title was, I should say, Healthy Soils for Food System Resiliency. And when, when I was thinking about that, like what, you know, that's a really hard decision to make in your life when you're studying something. What is this project going to be that's going to define my career? You know, they warn you, this is will define you. And I, I remember sitting there thinking, I really want to solve a problem. And I want to, I want to learn about soils in order to find ways to help solve a problem. And the moment I had that thought and I said it out loud, I felt like a thousand angels were like poking me all over my body. You know, that whole body chill thing you get. I, and so I knew I was on the right track. And I know that I'm on the right track now too, because that happens more and more frequently. In fact, it happened a lot this weekend, Soil Sisters, um, when you were telling me about your moments like that. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And um, just for a little bit of context on the background of Trish, um, first of all, while we were talking, I was able to pull up a slide that you have used in the past oh, really wow. quickly. And here it is. I think this is kind of what, can you guys see my screen here? Oh. Um, this is one thing that, that we're kind of talking about is that we're, um, we're wanting to understand that what we're doing is very circular and um, right. kind of to transition over into specific topics of agriculture. And we can get into that a little bit later. You know, we've talked about, you know, fighting the system and we're going to win the war and we're going to, we're going to do all these things. And so my question um, later on, as we get into this is like, how well is that working? So I just, I think it was you that had first shared this image with me and I was able to find it really, really fast while you were talking. Um, but just a little bit of context. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. Um, you and I both lived in a small town recently and, um, I had gone through my soil regen journey um, as a farmer and married to an agronomist and learning a little bit more about our food production systems and just really falling in love with, with how farming works and admiring farmers and ranchers and understanding that even though I didn't grow up in a farming family, there were so many amazing life lessons that can be learned um, by working in farming systems. And so uh, at about gosh, it's been, I don't even know how many years ago it's been. I helped groups of a community start a farmer's market. And I had my first ever, you know, like session where I was trying to invite the public in to learn about uh, local food issues. <clears throat> and so we did this whole promotion and we had social media and anyway, six people showed up. It was myself and another speaker. There was about three people that worked at the library. And then... <laughs> And then Trish came because at that time you're working with biochar. That's so right. tell us a little bit about how you got to, to Pratt, Kansas, USA, and um, just the phenomenon of biochar and how you started seeing this whole health that you had fallen in love with through the educational lens. You're starting to see this now in action. Well, let me, let me give you a little bit of background on how I discovered biochar, because that's kind of an interesting moment um, for anyone, if you, if you have go through the same thing. It's really an ancient technology, and I had my dissertation advisor uh, was Bill Woods at KU, and he was the foremost expert in anthropogenic soils in a lot of different places in the world, uh, namely the um, Brazilian Amazon. And there's an anthropogenic soil there, you know, made by people. And the main ingredient there that makes that so special is biochar. And so um, as I moved into an assistant professorship at South Dakota State University, I decided I really wanted to study biochar because I saw that it had so much potential because carbon, you know, being the basis of all life and carbon rich soils being the most fertile soils 
um, on earth and seeing how this ancient technology was so simple. If you know people thousands of years ago could figure this out, why can't we recreate that? So that's when I got um, really intrigued by biochar. And for those of you ha who haven't heard about it, it's, a, it's basically a special charcoal that's made um, by, it's burning's not really the, the right word here if you wanna be technical, but it's, it's thermochemically decomposed with uh, in a low oxygen environment. So you basically take wood, you starve it of oxygen and, and you burn it. Um, and it, it keeps a lot of the mineral nutrients and that form of the carbon that was the tree or was the biomass intact. Um, and so I started doing research when I was at South Dakota State um, in the Amazon, I got to go there. And I also did research um, with a farmer in South Dakota and I had amazing results. I mean, amazing things were happening. And uh, my parents said, well, hey, if you want to do that kind of research here on our family farm in Kansas, we'll let you do that. We'll let you have make the land use decisions. So that's why I ended up in Pratt, Kansas and met Je Jess. I, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was, it was so amazing. Started, it was as close as I could get to the family farm and still have a job in higher education. Well, and I think what's so fun about this is um, when I first started learning about soil health, it felt like there was just pockets of renegades all over. And it really felt like Kansas yeah. was the core, just in my fishbowl that I exist in. I was like, man, there's some really cool stuff happening. And I kept hearing about these renegade farmers that were, you know, growing their own fertilizer, that were, your, you know, creating your own biochar pits. And my natural instinct as a, as a curious person is like, oh, who are they? Like, let's go, let's go drive to their place and figure out what they're doing. Um, but let me just ask you this question because <clears throat> for me, when I started learning about all of these weird and funky and renegade things, I was like, yeah, but this, we all can't do this. Like this is, this is a niche thing. This is kind of the weirdo dude in the corner. Um, <laughs> And we met plenty of them. What are you <laughs> <laughs> I said, dude, you know, dude. Yeah. So anyway, um, and you know, my, my husband as, as a trained agronomist, you know, he's like, yeah, that's, that's great, Jess, but this isn't real life. Like this can't be scaled. We can't actually do this. Tell me a little bit about some of your research findings when it comes to nutrient density, because we can talk about soils. We can talk about the native states of soils. And I've had people say, you can't change your soil. We've got producers on this call. We've got producers we've worked with that have changed soil. So let's, we, you know, let's establish that point. But number two, um, what changes with the food that is produced in more nutrient dense soils? Wonderful question. Um, that was one of the most exciting results uh, with the work that I did in South Dakota. This, this farmer uh, was growing um, aronia berries, also known as choke cherries. So he had some perennial berries and then he had uh, annual you know, vegetable crops, um, just you know, tomatoes and a, a thousand different kinds of peppers. And so we were able to look at um, how those um, plants responded to increases in soil health through addition of compost and biochar. And what we found was when the soil's functioning better, the nutrients are cycling better. And so the plant has access to more of what it needs. And so a lot of that, of those mineral nutrients that are missing in, a, in our food system today were present in those fruits and vegetables that were grown in healthier soils. We saw not only increases in yields, but across the board, um, increases in nutrient density. And that's, that's those mineral nutrients. And a lot of them saw like tomatoes or had um, increases in sugars. So they more, were more delicious um, and more nutrient dense and more abundant. So why wouldn't you do that, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, oh, I think that's the million dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, why wouldn't you do that? But we, we currently don't exist in an agricultural system that focuses on nutrient density. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There's, there's like no one in particular reason, but um, I've said this many times on our webinar, <clears throat> COVID has exposed the uh, intricacies, but the vulnerabilities of our supply chain. 
<clears throat> and all those years ago, when you and I were talking at farmers markets, you know, just really going to the, the backyard gardener um, and talking about soil health, and we would we would talk about nutrient density, and it really just kind of fell. Um, really, it didn't go anywhere. The message didn't go anywhere, and so now because of COVID, I think people genuinely understand that we need we have a broken food system. And I saw a quote the other day on Facebook from our good friend, Nicole Raglan, the local food system is not broken. <clears throat> it's the big food system. So how do we farm and think about nutrient density? And I know that's probably a question to, you know, bring in Liz and Russell and Sarah and just talk a little bit more about, you know, how do we do that? So we'll, we'll pull that in here <clears throat> at the end, but that is a question I have a lot of concern about because I'm a mom and I've got three kiddos and we don't have to look very far to understand that the nutrient qualities of, of our produce and, and our food items have declined since I was their age. So that is a big concern for my, for me, you know, and um, I know that, that Prairie Food talks a lot about soil health. They talk about people health and we talk about this triple bottom line. Is that a good transition? Yeah, that was excellent. I felt like, you know, when you say, how do you farm for nutrient dense food? I thought it was a rhetorical question, you know, no, I, actually, the soil. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, but I think that's the big question that people have, you know, yeah, um, yeah. I've been doing soil health education now since that single webinar that we did with six people, you know, we've gotten to do uh -huh. huge, huge events. And I do think, um, you know, we've done a lot of preaching. We've done a lot of evangelical soil evangelist type stuff, but people genuinely want to know, okay, how, like, mm -hmm. I got it. How do we do this? Well, that's pretty exciting. I have an answer for that. So you mentioned Prairie Food and that um, um, this company that I now work for that I'm very much in love with is a 3P bottom line company, people, planet, and profit. And that profit's not just for prairie food, it's for the farmer as well. So we're a farmer forward um, company. And so what we're doing is we're finding ways to take care of the soil inside of the current agricultural system. So we take agricultural products, um, manure, distiller's grain, for example, those biomasses, and we put it through our reactor, our special process, and what comes out the other end is this liquid carbon. And that liquid carbon is very much similar to the same liquid carbon that plants feed the soil through their root systems. And so what we figured out is we can mimic nature through the circular use of these nutrients in a local system and get those back into the soil to take care of the soil. And we can apply it using you know, normal big ag kind of equipment sprayers through the pivot and through you know in through the furrow um, however you need to do it but but we're finding is is that the soil health taking care of the soil is making bigger better plants and more nutrient dense grains and so that's that's the second part of my research um, in nutrient density is we've seen huge increases in nutrient density through use of prairie food because we're taking care of the soil we're feeding that soil microbial ecosystem that does the work for us. Yeah, awesome. Hey, David, um, I saw your question there in the chat. David Collins um, would like to know, Trish, how are you guys measuring that right now? Like, and, and you can talk about your research, how you guys did it, you know, you know, how you did it for your research. And then like, what's the easiest, most accessible way to measure nutrient density? What we do is um, we take um, plant tissue samples throughout the growing season, and then we take grain samples at the end of the growing season, send them to Lance at Regent Ag Lab, and um, he does a routine plant analysis. So we can, we can compare you know, how the plant's performing without prairie food and with prairie food, and we can see that that concentration of nutri nutrients in the prairie food grown plants is higher. So it's a pretty simple, uh, sampling process and a pretty simple lab process. Well, maybe not so much. They have the fancy yeah. equipment, but, but um, it's really easy to see that signal in the results. It's very clear. So that's the, is that the P, PLFA? No, the PLFA is 
phospholipid fatty acids. That's a okay. different test that that's you know looking at the microbes, the microbial populations in the soil. Okay, so you guys are doing tissue samples throughout the growing season, um, and sending that in, and then looking at the grain after the fact. That's correct. What's a uh, what's reasonable? Um, well, first of all, our good buddy Durbin, Jeremiah Durbin, who this is his famous tagline is what's your baseline? Um, do, is this something that you have to do multiple seasons to kind of figure out where your crop production is? Or do you gain benefit in year one of taking the samples and then looking at the grain at harvest? Well, we've seen um, one year, I mean, it's an instantaneous response because we're basically providing food for every single organism that's living in the soil, you know, the moment the prairie food hits the ground because it's the, the way that it's constructed or the biomass is deconstructed, I, I should say, allows for a carbon that's in a form that feeds every single microbe. And so instead of starting, you know, just feeding one microbe or, and we're not a biologic, right? We're not adding microbes to the soil. We're feeding everything. So we, we end up with a more robust system and the soil ecology is kind of functioning better and better and better. And so as, as that um, soil function increases, the plant, plant responds and then the plant is able to grow more and photosynthesize more and pulling more carbon out of the atmosphere, feeding the soil more. So where we're seeing um, increases in soil health, we also see increases in organic matter in the soil, but that carbon really isn't coming from the carbon that we added to the soil through prairie food. It's coming from that enhanced soil plant interaction. Um, I don't know what the question was now. I kind of got off <laughs> on a, on a no. different train of thought. Uh, you know, we were just talking about the, the nutrient density and you had mentioned this is not a biological um, input. So you're not actually adding biology. You are facilitating the, the biology. You're fe yeah. okay. Feeding. We're feeding the biology. It's prairie food. It's literally food for the soil. So here's a topic that and guys, we're not going to give away too much because we want you to come to our event on November 15th and 16th. <laughs> yes, we um, do. And I'm going to put, I'll put the information in the chat box. I'll also put the slides that I used in the chat box too. Um, but if it's okay, I wanted to check my um, attendees here because we do have a couple questions and Deanna really wants to talk about fertilizer. And does fertilizer have a negative effect of the grain, of the nutrient density of the grain? And I would like to also queue up Liz and Russell. I think I saw them on the call. So just a heads up, you guys are, you guys are queued up for the next question. Liz, are you taking this one? I'm Let's going go to you Liz. first. I'm Me going first? to you first, yeah. Me first, okay. <laughs> I don't, I think that, um, you know, there's a, there's a wide variety of quality of fertilizer, but if you break it down to it's just chemical, you know, structure at the, you know, at the very basic level. So you have like NPK, you know, sulfur, zinc, you know, micronutrients. Those are all things that the soil needs and the plant needs. And so, so I don't think that necessarily adding fertilizer in and of itself is going to harm the system, but I think that there needs to be awareness of what form it's in and amounts, you know, anything and too much of, an, of a high level is going to be toxic to any person or any ecosystem. And so those are the sorts of things I would, I would be aware of. Okay, Deanna, does that kind of answer your question a little bit, but um, really want to queue up one thing, one thing that's happened in the world is, um, we're seeing shortages of a lot of things Our you know, supply chains are broken. We've got issues in global transportation. We have issues in, you know, home transportation, even in the United States. And so as a person that's involved with agriculture, but, but maybe not a boots on the ground farmer, like a lot of you on this call, I'm having a hard time understanding what's going on with prices right now. What's, what does the average person need to know about what the farmer is facing right now with input prices? And that was the question I was trying to queue up to, 
missile, Mr. Russell Hedrick with from Hickory, North Carolina. But is he there? Russell, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, could you give us an, a better understanding of, of what's happening right now um, with input prices and why? Well, right now I'm in the combine, so is it too loud? Can you hear me okay? You're okay, but you can give us the gist if you want to. Um, the, the, the problem is not even just fertilizer pricing. Um, it's also availability. So there's a worldwide energy shortage. And, you know, China came out a couple weeks ago, said that they're not going to be exporting phosphorus until the end of 2020 or later. Um, they supply 49% of the phosphorus to the U.S. for agriculture purposes. So 49% of our phosphorus just up and disappeared overnight. Um, and then you've also got, you know, gas shortages. I'm sure a lot of people have seen natural gas is on the rise, and home heating. And, you know, one of the big issues that we're facing here is um, whether they're going to heat homes this winter or make nitrogen fertilizers. So it really comes down to one, the price of it. Uh, most fertilizers have at least doubled in price, uh, if not more. And then the other part of it is, is even availability. Even if you can afford to pay for it, um, are they actually going to have it? Because there's a lot of retailers that are out of, out of fertilizer right now, and even our chemicals. Um, you know, farmers that are relying on a lot of chemicals, um, there's, there's a shutdown in the pipeline there as well. So we don't, you know, I would, I would imagine, and I'll be very surprised, and I'll say it on this call, even though it's recorded, but if our food prices aren't, at least 10 to 20 percent higher this coming year i'll be very surprised wow that's that's uh that's pretty intense christy could you uh, chime in here this is christy apple hi friends um so i i wanted to to kind of expound a little bit on on where Russell was coming from with the, the fertilizer on the commercial scale. And also briefly to address that previous question of, uh, that, um, that Trish had kind of given an explanation there. There's a couple of things to, to think about when we're making fertility choices. And one of those very important pieces that I think that we miss in modern agriculture because we are so modern, um, we, we're spending a lot of time, energy resources, agronomic, uh, collateral to um, get partial recommendations. And most of the world has been making nutrient and fertility oil recommendations with partial information, completely disregarding the biological component and potential of your soils. And so I think that this is, um, it's, it's, a, it's something that needs to be deeply um, addressed a, as a whole. And so, uh, you know, who, whomever shall receive the, the finger wagging or the tongue lashing for what's happening within our, our supply chains, our, our fertility supply chains, especially right now, is kind of irrelevant. Um, but what we have to face is it isn't just phosphate that's going to be approximately half in supply, but also commercial units of N in the form of 32%, of, 28% um, and urea. And so there's areas of modern agriculture, like here in Michigan, where we use very little anhydrous. Right now, anhydrous is in of supply, but those products are competitive in their in their manufacture too, as Russell mentioned, natural gas. And so we have to kind of we have to really recognize the fact that did I lose you guys? Nope. We okay, still got you. Go. Okay, I'm sorry. My screen just went totally blank, and I have no idea why. But so, so keep, keep in the, keep in the context of we're missing out on the biological component when we're when we're consulting with the ag retailer who's also selling us our fertilizer. Um, and there's no shame in that game. I am that person. I owned an ag retail for 13 years. My husband and I built a, a very successful business, but we were ignorant to this biological component in terms of soil fertility recommendations. But we've always been ahead of the curve in recognizing the value of feeding the soil microbes simultaneously while we're delivering fertility to the plant and delivering fertility to the plant that is both feeding the plant as well as the microbes through the exudate and that symbiosis. So there's some really important things to, to pull apart in, in this conversation, you know, right here. And, and that being, we have to open our minds to um, leveraging tools that 
that the Haney test is bringing to our, our table. Taking a look at the PFLA, as, as Trish mentioned, and how does that play a role in our soil's resiliency and its ability to change if we're amending or its ability to produce whatever that cropping system looks like. And then also recognizing that our traditional tools are, are going to be absent. Mm -hmm. um, the comfort zone tools that we have that we've always utilized you know, in, in wide scale broad acre agriculture are just simply not going to be there. Um, and that's very frustrating. And there's a, there is going to be an entire uh, psychological impact of that this winter yeah. as farmers begin to believe it. There's been shortages discussed many times over the last several years, but never came to fruition. We're quite literally facing the actual reality of that happening. So there's a neat opportunity for somebody who is engaging in this conversation of, of transitioning to a more, um, feeding the soil approach to their crop nutrition. So it's, it's a cool time to be alive. If yeah. You, have, you know, if you can hang in there. <laughs> Thank you, Christy. Um, no, I think that's fantastic. And, and you talked about producers are getting partial information. And I, I think, um, I think what you're talking about is they're not looking at biology. So when you say partial information, are you, are you talking more about they're, they're getting the chemistry side and not necessarily adding in the biological side. And then that kind of takes us into Pamela's question in the chat that I'll transition over to Liz for, but is that kind of what yeah. you mean for partial information is we're not, we're not looking at the whole system. Right. So most of uh, most of the, the labs um, that are doing soil sampling analysis, soil analysis for modern ag for wide scale ag are doing just a chemical property PPMs. Mm -hmm. Um, they're they're took, taking a look at soil pH, which is important. Sometimes you can get base saturations if you check the right box to get base saturations. Occasionally you can get micronutrient levels again in a PPM status, but all that's really doing is taking a look at a, a, a dry extracted method mm -hmm. that's completely devoid of, of biological function. And, and so one of the missions I think that, that kind of threads all of us together here that are on this call and what Prairie Food is about and, and what you know your organization is about and each of us are, are, are on a mission to help bring to the forefront is the dynamic biological potential within our soil structures require us to look at other things and, and not just a PPM, right? That's a volumetric measure and that has absolutely no regard for what the potential might be and not being a traditionally trained agronomist I, I my agronomy path came from a different direction so I walked into this field of study without the the common academia constraints um, I didn't learn crop and soil sciences from a from a professor who was vested in his personal paper that he published or yeah. or some type of dogma right so there's some really um, closely held dogmas associated with crop fertility and soil amending. And so if we can get the message out there to help understand how the biological component can change how we fertilize, in fact, you know, even fractions of nitrogen or fractions of phosphorus or potassium or something else may be released by our soils because of its natural ability. And if mm -hmm. we're feeding the soil mi microbial activity, again, our soil sampling protocols of the last 80 years are devoid of that piece. If we can add in our understanding of that biological component, suddenly a nitrogen shortage shouldn't scare you. Suddenly yeah. a phosphorus shortage shouldn't be a, a crippling, you know, damaging thing to your farm. In fact, you may, this may be the year that your farm gets a fighting chance to reestablish what it naturally wants to exist at in a, in a, a, a the balance between bacterial and fungal microbes um, and, and what it's actually capable of doing. So that's amazing. I that, I mean, that totally gives me chills. And I think that nobody wants to, nobody wants to definitely see anybody suffer, but that, you know, talking about partial information, um, Liz, I'm going to cue you up here to talk a little bit about um, the question that Pamela was asking in the chat, you know, she says, doesn't the plant opt for plant available fertilizer rather than cultivating the microbial community, which results in compaction, excess above ground growth, runoff of 50% of the mobile fertilizer. Seems 
nutrient density would be affected if microbial community isn't as robust or engaged. So you're in the hot seat. Okay. Yes. Well, there's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, the plant, plant available fertilizer is also the organic portions of, of nutrients that are in the soil. So it doesn't just come from the fertilizer that we add. They're not cultivating the microbial community so much as, um, I mean, they do have rhizophagy, but they're not cultivating the microbial community. What happens is, is that the microbial community is getting lazy. They don't have to produce as much. They don't have as much carbon coming from their uh, plants. They don't have as much of a resource to be active and, and do you know, active nutrient cycling. So that's who gets lazy. It's not the plant, it's the microbial community. And we also, I think when we add fertilizer, we are selecting for the microbes in the soil that may not cycle the nutrients like the way we want them to. Really? So, yeah. So there's, that's how I see it. Um, it's like when you get your body used to eating just ice cream, you're going to metabolize things differently than if you eat whole foods and plants and vegetables. And, and so it's the same kind of a thing in the soil. Um, so we're like monocropping our gut. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> So, okay, Trish, talk to me about lazy microbes. What, give me your perspective on lazy microbes. And then, so you said prairie food's not a biological, right? So it's a food. And I have no idea. We didn't script this question, but <laughs> how does, how does, you know, how do these soil health amendments, um, what's, what's the goal? Do you have lazy microbes? Well, I mean, if you think about a field that's been aggressively tilled and, you know, the aggressive um, use of, of chemicals and fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers over decades, um, you have in impacted that soil microbiology. Um, the soils are likely bacterial dominated. Um, and so, and they're exactly what Liz and, and Christy were talking about. You, you get kind of a a different population of microbes for one thing, and then and then they're not doing the jobs that as they were designed by Mother Nature. And so if you start um, using a soil amendment such as prairie food that's carbon rich, that helps start you know building up the soil ecosystem as it was meant to be, you start treating the soil right. So so partnering with Mother Nature through regenerative practices. So those practices that you highlighted at the beginning of the webinar today, um, all of a sudden the diversity of microbes increases because you know microbes are ubiquitous everywhere around us. Um, you start to balance out the population so that you know if you ever had a, like a you know ecology 101, you know that every every part of an ecosystem has a niche. And so that's the same thing with with microbes and in the soil. So you get these microbes that are doing their jobs as they as they were meant to do things start getting balanced out. And so the soil starts functioning better. And, you know, it is a process, you know, it depends on, on what you're doing, you know, some of the practices you use, how fast that recovery can happen. Um, but with regenerative ag and with a soil amendment like prairie food, that transition is so much faster to get the soil function back so that you don't have to supplement it so much with all of these inputs. Um, when the soil is functioning properly, you know, it, it has defense systems in there for, for you know, things that you might have been um, responding to with, you know, harsh chemicals. You might not need that anymore because the biology is taking care of it now. And so there's just, there's so many more benefits than just, um, you know, nutrient dense food um, to healing your soil. It's partnering with mother nature instead of that you know, that ego, that slide that you showed, showed us. It's exactly that. Yeah, this is, so I think one thing that we really want to talk about is, first of all, there's, we got a lot of nutty people on this call, like <laughs> <laughs> raise your hand. If you are a soil nerd, you love soil. You've been talking about this. There we go. I see. <laughs> I'm watching the profile. People are raising their hand. Um, but like I said, we're in a fishbowl though. Okay, Amber, I see you, girl. 
nutty. Totally. We're in a fishbowl. <laughs> Angela, I got gotcha. you. Rob. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk amongst ourselves as much as we want to. And we do like, we actually travel together. <laughs> we go on vacations together. Mike, Mike's totally, Oh, Mike said he's nerdy and lazy in Iowa. I don't believe you, Mike, but anyway, so what we need to do is we need to be able to extend our message out, um, into the world. And interestingly enough, I know that the way in which we have started the conversation is not the way that we will continue the conversation. So um, I think the point of us choosing to do the Prairie Food Forum in Pratt, Kansas, uh, for a lot of reasons, like let's, let's go to the middle of Kansas. That's a great place to get started. We've got a lot of acres um, in that area. And um, it's a great time, I think, to start having this conversation. So what is Prey Food's focus moving forward? Prairie Food is focused on farmer education and just promoting this whole idea of people, planet, and profit, that we can help farmers make that transition to become more profitable. That, that's really it. We, we want to help farmers. Um, uh, and we have a way, we feel like this is um, um, partnering with mother nature, that we're healing um, this sort of, you know, linear system that we've had of extraction, and we're, we're closing that loop of nutrient cycling. Um, and I just, um, I'm really, really happy to say that we're farmer focused and that we're planning on educating and we're learning along with the farmer as well. But do you uh, have so to be a nerd? My question is, do you have to be a soil <laughs> nerd though to do this? Because some people, you know, it's, it's like not everybody's going to jump on some of the vernacular here. Like some folks are going to be forced yeah. to change kind of like what Christy was referring to and what Russell was talking about. Yeah. Um, I'm getting a big thumbs up from Ron right now. Um, as the Mandalorian says, is this the way? So to me, there's a huge transition that's happening. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think if I could unpack what you're saying is that prairie food is for everybody, but the, the education is the precursor to it, like understanding why you're doing something a certain way you're doing. And, and for a lot of folks, it might just be because I have no other options, right? Just That's we, right. we built that up. Yeah, mm -hmm. we built that up. So yeah. getting people into the mix right now to talk about soil, there's never been a time in my, like I, I it keeps me up at night because we used to just be weird, random people talking in the coffee shop and you're like, oh, I don't really know who's listening. And now it's like, <laughs> man, it's, it's the soil. We've been talking about this for years. Yeah. How do we make that transition so that everybody um, puts that emphasis back into the soul? And also without, you know, we don't need a finger point or anything. Like, like I said, we don't tell farmers how to farm. That's right. We, we try to highlight and activate, um, you know, the soul health message. So that's what I see happening right now with what you guys are doing. It's that profitability piece. Um, so you know, with an input like prairie food, you can um, all of a sudden you don't have to irrigate as much or you're capturing more water in your dry land system. So you have higher yields, you know, with better soil health, you have higher yields, no matter what your watering system is. You're saving, saving so much money on inputs and energy and fuel um, that that's the piece that's convinced a lot of people. So for example, we have a, a feedlot in Western Kansas, and they just saw their, their yields decline, decline, decline over the past 10 years. They couldn't figure out what was happening. You know, why is this happening? They, you know, they were doing the same thing they had always done, but those yields just kept declining. And so they were ready for a solution. And so they, they tried prairie food this year and guess what? They increased their yield significantly. They were able to turn off their irrigation a lot more of the time. So they saved on water. Um, their inputs were decreased. And so the, just like you said, Jess, um, people are ready for an answer and maybe yeah. they're not ready to hear, you know, understand soil science at a deep level, but, but 
they're looking for something new, a, a solution. Yeah, do you think, uh, we're getting lots of amazing stuff in the chat here. One thing I wanna hit on, you guys, tell me how, tell me how the plant works because you're solving more than one problem. You're also converting feedlot manure, which is a problem and it's a problem in Kansas. Even people that, that are, you know, I've driven out through Southwestern Kansas. We have an excess of um, those nutrients out on the land. So at what quantities are you guys able to convert this feedlot manure? So tell me, I mean, cause you, I feel like you guys are creating a solution in the beginning the middle and the end yeah. <laughs> right now? Well, right now there's there's way more crap out there than we can handle in our plant. But um, what's also interesting about prairie food is if we get the manure, just raw, you know, the raw or, you know, composted or conditioned manure out on the field, prairie food helps break that down a lot faster. And so between those two practices of using the manure as kind of a, you know, a compost as has been done for many, many decades with prairie food, that's another way that we can help um, reduce the manure problem. Then, you know, as soon as we get more prairie food plants distributed across the nation, then we'll be able to address some of those manure needs. Um, there's a lot of a lot of possibilities with the manure. Um, I don't, yeah. Rob, do you, did you wanna say something about that? Jess, can well, Rob come in for a and second? Yeah, so I'm gonna queue up Rob um, and give him a second here to get himself ready. But um, in the chat, we can have a competition. Whoever can come up with the funniest t-shirt that we need to print right now that uh, Trish, <laughs> Trish, I'm gonna, I'm gonna transcribe this. You had so many golden nuggets that I'm gonna turn into social media quotes about you know, there's a lot of crap in the world and we want to convert it and be able to, to, to <laughs> give you. So if anybody can come up with a good t-shirt tagline, I'll, I'll get it printed and I'll ship it to you. So um, Rob Harrington, uh, founder of Prairie Food. I've had the pleasure of knowing Rob for many years um, and being able to work with Rob um, over the years on various projects. So, um, okay, Rob, we've given a brief overview of what we're trying to do, but this whole question of you guys are dealing with a massive environmental problem. And not only are you addressing that, you're working on solving that issue, but in the process, you have a, you know, you have a byproduct that is equally as uh, amazing. So feel free to kind of fill in the gaps there. And can you hear me okay? <clears throat> Good to go. Um, Yes, the, fir the first stage of, of our process is to uh, take a, a biomass and break it down to the molecular level. That means all the way down to carbon, uh, sulfur, phosphorus, all the elemental levels. And what, that, what we do is we do that in one second. Mother Nature does it in 300 million years. So we've sped up the process dramatically and the other thing that we've done is we do it at the same location instead of linearly uh, sending it somewhere else like Mother Nature does underneath the tectonic plates to turn it into to oils or, or, or coal. And a good example of that is where does the phosphorus come today for, for, our, for our fields in Kansas? Well, most of it comes from Morocco. And it's shipped mined, it's shipped over in a boat, and then it's distributed out to finally get into the Kansas field. Uh, with prairie food, we can deconstruct that phosphorus and put it into a form that is readily available to the microbiome and given to the plant in one crop cycle. And we can do that within a 50 mile radius of our plant. So all of a sudden, we no longer linearize these, these components, and it reduces the input cost dramatically for the farmer, while at the same time increasing the soil health. The thing is, we have so much biomass, we have more than enough to put on the, the farm ground of the world. What we, what we have left over, which is about 90%, 10% can go down on farm ground, the 90% we can turn into renewable fuels. And that is the next phase of our business is to team up with ethanol plants and new plants that are creating renewable fuels instead of fossil fuels. 
in order to make this world a better place. And I think uh, from a long-term vision, that, that's me as a visionary looking at how we do that. We have, a, we have a process and a plant that's capable of doing both. Rob, that is amazing. Every time that I've talked to you, um, yeah, you, you definitely have that long-term vision. I'm really proud of how far Prairie Food has gone. I'm proud of the different solutions that your process can help bring not only to the people of Kansas, but to, to all of us out there. So um, to celebrate the um, world introduction to Prey Food, we are gonna host a ribbon cutting. I put a document in the chat box, but I'll put it in there again. It's open to the public. We're actually going to go to the Prey Food facility. It is at the Pratt Municipal Airport, which is just a few miles north of the town of Pratt, Kansas. And um, anybody can come and watch the process. Actually, I don't think you're going to be making any prey food that day, but you'll get to see, you know, see the equipment, see the plant, meet the people. We're going to have a ribbon cutting. And then at one o'clock on November 15th, it's a Monday, we're going to start the prey food forum. So the forum is going to consist of keynote speakers like Trisha Jackson, Russell Hedrick, Lance Gunderson. We're going to have local producers in the area. They're going to be talking about soil health. And so really it's a prey food forum because we'd like to educate you about prey food, but it's also a soil health workshop. What prey food has expressed to me over and over and over again is that they're willing to provide this information about soil health to anybody and everybody. So coupling the introduction of prey food um, with soil health education is absolutely key. And I will tell you that I've worked in this industry for a number of years as a freelance consultant, mm -hmm. and I've had more outreach from companies that I've never had outreach for in the past that might sell any particular input that we've talked about already about some of these shortages. And they're very well aware that their profile of offers or their profile of services or their, their profile of business needs to be focused on services. Like, how do we educate? Right. So um, we're seeing this and it's going to be fantastic. So join us. It's for two days in Pratt, Kansas. Um, we've hit the one o'clock hour, which is the fun hour. And I'm going to unpin everybody. Um, and then I'm also going to, after a few minutes, I'm going to stop recording. So if you're holding on to something that you want to ask our speakers or anybody on the call and you don't want to be recorded, let's give it a few minutes here and we can do that. So um, if everybody would like to turn on their cameras, if they're willing to do that, I, I'd like to have open um, question and answer. So you don't have to wait for me. You can turn on your, um, you can turn on your camera and really just, just have a question. I'm going to remove this pin here. Jess, I just want to, I want to add to what you said about the forum. So the event is a two day event. Day one is really you know, those speakers that Jess just talked about, all these rock stars, um, um, Russell, you just heard from him, and Lance Gunderson, who owns Soil uh, or Region Ag Labs. But we're also doing a day two, which is a farmer focused workshop. It's going to be all the nuts and bolts of soil region. So, regenerative ag learning from Russell and Liz. Liz is here. Um, and other farmers um, and how to use prairie food if, you, if you're interested in doing that. So it's going to be soil region and how to use prairie food, but very farmer focused. So that's kind of the practical day. And so I, I just wanted to highlight that for everyone here. I'm muted. All right, folks. And I'm also gonna add um, our link here into the chat yeah, box. Jimmy Emmons, don't forget about Jimmy. Yes, Jimmy's coming. Hold on. I apologize, guys. My link. You would think that by now I would, I would have all of my links preloaded in the background, but they're not. So here they are now. And then I do that weird, nervous sing song voice. It's really weird. Okay. So uh, Amber wants to know if the conference is going to be virtual or broadcast digitally. Um, there are going to be some components that we'll be able to broadcast during the event, but for the most part, um, the sessions will be recorded and then they will be placed on our YouTube channel after the fact, so you'll be able to check those out. Um, I need to give a quick shout out here because Mike was wearing his GPR hat, and so I wanted everybody to see Mike 
uh, not only is he a very attractive individual, but his hat is really attractive. <laughs> so um, we do have GPR merchandise. I'll put that in the chat box if you want to have that too. So Mike, did you have a, oh, and Pam, hi Pam. She's out in LA. She's got her GPL shirt. Thank you. Yeah. Everybody gets bonus points when they wear their um, GPR merch. Yeah. Okay. What's your question? Hour drive. It's just an eight and a half hour drive. And I, <laughs> I, I, I'll look, I'll put it on my calendar, but this just sounds like a wonderful forum. And don't forget the big soil conference that we're having in here in my neck of the woods in yes. early December that I yes. think you're part of, aren't you, Jess? Oh yeah. We're going to, we're going to do the big soil health event in Cedar Rapids, Iowa in December. I think Liz can. Washington. Well, it's oh, actually it's in, in, it's in Riverside at the Riverside. Oh, it's in Riverside. Uh -huh. That's right. Yeah. The so, home of uh, James T. Kirk. Speaking yeah, of nerds. I was just uh, about to say that. <laughs> no. Yeah. James Tiberius <laughs> Kirk. Totally. Will there be tacos? Yeah, I think so. There's always tacos. If I'm like, there. Where can you go where there's not tacos? All right, guys, what other questions do we have? Uh, specifically, I think we've established the fact that there might be tacos at the Prairie Food Forum. We know there's going to be bourbon. Um, we feel like it's important for us as we develop new markets to be able to um, also provide samples of that. So if you were on the fence about attending our event, uh, maybe you can jump on over to the side and join us. So what other questions do we have for Trisha Jackson? Um, anything about GPR. And um, I'm really impressed with how many people joined us today. I really thank you guys all for being here.